All right, everybody, welcome back to Women of the Bible Part 2. My Woo. name is Becca, and this is Sandy. Hi. Um, today, we're going to talk about the lineage of Jesus described in the first chapter of Matthew, which is a really interesting passage. Um, women, we, women were like not typically noted in historical documentation due to the patriarchal societies um, mm-hmm. at that time. But in Matthew chapter 1, there are a handful of women listed and noted due to their significance in the stories leading up to Mm -hmm. the birth, life, and um, death and resurrection Mm -hmm. of Jesus. And these women are as follows in chronological order, which we're going to talk about today. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and we were going to talk about Mary, mother of Jesus, but I actually decided we're going to talk about her in our next part, part Mm -hmm. three. Um, Mm -hmm. because it was so much information. There was Mm -hmm. no way I could cram it all into this episode of our Not Suited for Sunday School podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're excited to be back here with you guys talking about some badass women of the Bible together. And last time Sandy and I got to share with you, we discussed Miriam, Moses' sister, Zipporah, Moses' Mm -hmm. wife, Deborah, JL, and Lydia. So for more information on these women, please feel free to go back and listen to that podcast episode. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm going to have Matt link it here for your convenience as well. Um, But that was a lot of fun to film. And so Sandy and I decided, let's keep working through all the women of the Bible because there's several worth noting. Mm -hmm. Um, So today we're going to kick things off with Tamar. Um, Mm. Sandy, do you want to actually start off with Tamar for us today? Yeah. So I'll I'll go ahead and start. Um, so since she is first in the maternal lineage, and I'm sorry, I'm going to read because I don't know. I don't I don't recognize the name Tamar. So I'm going to learn a lot. Today. <laughs> <laughs> in the first maternal lineage mentioned for Jesus in Matthew 1, 1 through 16, Tamar's story is incredibly odd for lack of a better term. This poor woman was tossed around to different men with within one family. Oh, my gosh. And treated as an and even called a prostitute that's so sad so she was totally the victim Mm -hmm. and blamed Mm -hmm. oh already starting off like starting off strong (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah uh she was originally married to a man named ur son of judah is that my saying that Mm -hmm. right er okay ur was a wicked man as genesis 38 describes and ultimately god puts this man to death Judah then tells another one of his sons, Onan, to sleep with Tamar to fulfill his duty as brother-in-law, Ugh. to make sure she has children. Don't love that. <laughs> no. Okay. So this is like culturally a tradition that would happen. So say oh. you were married to a man and he had a brother and the husband that you were married to passes away. His brother would step in to make sure that you had children to carry on oh. your lineage and like your legacy basically. So okay. it was at that time it was a traditional <laughs> cultural. Right. Okay. And women at the time if they weren't married or didn't have ch- children or like lived with their parents they were pretty much discarded by society Mm. and really had nothing Mm. um so it was a way to sort of take care of women Mm. but also it's kind of like an arranged marriage so it was this weird like catch-22 like sorry society doesn't really see you as a normal human Mm. um or worth anything so we're gonna make sure that you have a man to sleep with to make sure you have a kid (sighs) like and it's also gonna be someone that is in your family Mm. Yeah, so it's not a mm. great situation, obviously. Yeah, woman had it tough, <clears throat> historically. Oh, yeah. oh my God. So well, that's why that's a thing there. Today, yeah. Mm-hmm. So Onan didn't like this plan, so he chose not to fulfill his brother-in-law obligation. If you'd like some more explicit details on that, you can read through Genesis 38. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's definitely an interesting little story there. Um, yeah, I'll let mm-hmm. you guys read that. <laughs> Put in the comments what you think. <laughs> <laughs> um, God deemed Onan's action to be wicked, and he also was put to death. Wow. I will say the fact that God cares so much about Tamar having some form of a legacy and caring for, her, yeah, caring for her lineage is pretty refreshing. But the way that these men sort of toss her around as a baby factory is inexcusable. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I feel like... Tamar like obviously at that time she probably wanted a kid and Mm. you know but her first husband that she was arranged to be married to Mm. um was 
we just know that he's a wicked man. So we could assume that maybe he was abusive or something mm. like that. And God protected her and Ur was it was put to death. And mm. then Judah was like, oh, well, don't worry. I have another son that you can have. Mm. And then when that didn't work out, God put Onan to death. And then he actually had a third son. Mm. Judah had a third son that he should have let Tamar mm-hmm. have. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. So mm. I don't want to spoil anything. Okay. <laughs> wow. Poor Tamar. But in, but you're saying that God is, like, protecting her from these men. Yeah, in yeah. a lot of ways. I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. it was probably an arranged marriage to begin with because at that time, like, uh, marriages were arranged okay. for whether it was land or property mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. to get families. Kind of like Romeo and Juliet, you know, like, oh, our families can't associate like it would be to bring families together or things like that so there was lots of reasons for arranged marriages back then i'm not saying they're valid or this should ever happen Mm -hmm. i'm just communicating the culture at the time yeah and this is not even the weirdest part of the story we haven't got there yet tamar's story is insane wow okay let's continue it's like a netflix documentary today yeah it's wild (laughs) oh my gosh we're (laughs) diving in okay so after judah's second attempt at giving tamar one of his sons to continue her lineage lineage fails he tells tamar to go back to her father and live as a widow which she does after a long time judah's wife passes and judah journeys up to where Tamar is living to shear his sheep. Tamar is a little bit sneaky here and takes off her widow's clothing and puts on a veil to disguise herself. Now, at this time, this could be a symbol that she was a prostitute, though she wasn't. Judah Judah sees her and treats her as such. Judah gives Tamar a seal, a cord, and his staff as payment until a goat could be given to her in exchange for sex. Naturally, Tamar becomes pregnant. Three months later, Judah finds out that Tamar is pregnant with his baby, and he states that she is more righteous than he because Judah did not let her sheep and his third son, Sheila, but instead sent her to be a widow at home. Hmm. Okay, so a little context here. Basically, Judah should have let Tamar and Shelah uh, Mm -hmm. come together and have a child. Mm. But instead of giving uh, Tamar his third son, Mm -hmm. he's like, go home to your parents and live as a widow. Like, basically, go back to your parents and be Mm -hmm. their responsibility. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, fast forward, Judah's wife passes Mm. and Judah's on his way to go like shear his sheep and, you know, do his thing. And he comes across Tamar, Mm -hmm. who is technically dressed as a prostitute, but is not a prostitute. Mm -hmm. But she does this very specifically because she's like, you owe me a kid. Mm. And so she's kind of like working the system here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how he doesn't recognize her. I guess the veil, Mm -hmm. but I don't know. That seems odd to me. And so when he first finds out that she's pregnant and somebody tells him like, oh, Tamar's a prostitute and she's pregnant. And he's like, oh, wow, that's crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. But then he finds out it's actually his kid. (laughs) And then he's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. Like, she basically (laughs) swindled me. And he's like, but she's more righteous than me because I should have given her the third son. So I can't even be mad about it. Mm. It's And he doesn't want people to know that he thought he was sleeping with a prostitute. So he's also trying to protect his own reputation. Oh, wow. I'm telling you, Netflix documentary. Like, yeah, this is yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so all that to say, she ends up getting the her son or a child in her lineage, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually, she is one of the matriarchal or maternal people in line to Jesus. So she's part of Jesus's heritage. Wow. Which, so down the road, and you'll see, um, but down the road, it eventually goes to Mary, mother of Jesus. It's like Tamar, Rahab. That's all within Jesus's lineage. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Whoa. Yeah, so all the women we're talking about today are mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 as part of Jesus' lineage. That's why we're talking about them because women were not talked about in lineage. It was only the men that were ever, like, discussed. Uh Uh-huh. They're like, oh, it was this person and this person, and they were all dudes. But in this particular lineage, when they're describing Jesus' lineage, Mm -hmm. they named Tamar, Rahab, um, Ruth, and then Mary, mother of Jesus. Wow. Which is unheard of at this time. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> like blown away. <laughs> Isn't it so, a crazy story? Yeah. So if she hadn't gotten pregnant, the lineage would have been different. Mm-hmm. Jesus would have had a different lineage, but God placed Jesus 
in this family tree. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like intentionally to show like um, that. I don't know how to say this like perfectly, but um, just like Jesus rode in on a donkey instead of like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, oh, you know, yeah, chariot chariot, and like he came and he was born in a stable. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Like I'm trying to like connect (laughs) um, that Jesus was placed in this family tree where there can be brokenness Mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't perfect um but god still worked in that that's just so amazing i'm like getting goosebumps (laughs) god works in these miraculous ways and even Mm -hmm. when we feel like we have nothing left to offer or we Mm -hmm. feel like we've lost all hope or we're at a dead end like that's when god steps in and does a miracle Mm -hmm. and i think that's really really cool like we were talking about the story of moses this morning and i don't know i just i love these types of stories like the most unexpected of places mm-hmm. and the most unexpected people mm-hmm. are used for some pretty amazing, extraordinary things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And I would say, too, like, Tamar as a widow would be considered a low, lower class citizen and would mm-hmm. really have, like, a wasted life. No kids, no job, no social standing, nothing. Mm-hmm. So Tamar sort of took back what she was owed from her marriage into the family of Judah. Mm. She had kids, a lineage, elderly care, a life, a social mm-hmm. status, etc. So she basically was making a life for herself by mm. doing that. Mm. Um, and we don't see much of a condoning or not condoning in the story. But what we do see is God eliminating the two sons of Judah, Onan and Ur, that were not fulfilling their marital obligations. Mm. And were also not treating her appropriately. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and we read that, like I said, Ur was wicked. And now we don't know if that means like violent or abusive or what. Mm-hmm. But we can assume it's not great. And like God was protecting her from that mm-hmm. um, and removed him from her life, um, which would not have been done in the society at that time. Like it would have all been perfectly acceptable. Mm-hmm. Um and so we can infer that God is making a statement here on how men should treat women, i.e. not wickedly. Mm. Before we move on to the next woman that we're going to talk about today, I believe what we really see is that God chose a very unique set of men and women to be a part of Jesus' lineage, um, mm-hmm. probably to make the points that we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe that that point is no one should be deemed unusable or unlovable by mm. God. Um, no one is discredited or discounted mm-hmm. um, because God's power is to give us potential is unlimited. And if we mm-hmm. choose to walk in obedience, he will protect, care for, and use us for some incredible things in life. Yeah. And experience a life that we could have never imagined. So. Yeah. Wow. What a great message. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's Tamar. That was awesome. It's really not super strong. <laughs> we just wow. dove right into the deep end on that one. Um, the next lady we're going to discuss today is Rahab. Um, I would say that Rahab's a bit more popular. Like, I would say more mm-hmm. people would have probably heard the name Rahab. And I feel like as we get into the stories, it's like Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. Like, obviously, a lot of people know Ruth. It's like a whole book in the Bible. So mm-hmm. there's a lot more understanding of Ruth and, and her story. So I love that we start with someone that people don't know a lot about and mm-hmm. we get a little bit more progressively known. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But Rahab in Joshua 2, as we read, um, <clears throat> we read that the Israelites, in an attempt to spy on the land of Jericho, before its inevitable fall, hid in a woman's house by the name of Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. She hid the two spies that the Israelites had sent and told the people looking for these spies from the city of Jericho that they had left before the gate closed to the city for the evening. So the reason Rahab did this, according to Joshua 2, is because she believed the stories of the Israelites and in the power of God. So even though Jericho was not a God-fearing city and that's Mm -hmm. where she lived, Mm -hmm. she was believing and hearing of the stories of the Israelites and Mm -hmm. was like, that is clearly the God of the universe. Wow. And when the Israelites came in and were spying on the city to see, okay, how can we overtake this city? She decided to help them out. So Mm -hmm. she offered to hide them for the night in return for the safety of her whole family, again, Mm -hmm. protecting her lineage. Mm -hmm. So the reason she's doing this is because she wants to make sure her family is protected when Israel inevitably comes in and invades Jericho Mm -hmm. because she believes it's going to happen she's Mm -hmm. seen what Israel has done and gone through Mm -hmm. and she's like Jericho's next Mm -hmm. and so she's like I've got to protect my family Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so she's like, all right, I'll hide you in my roof under my hay. Mm-hmm. And all I need you to do is just make sure that my family is protected. Which is a pretty courageous and, like, honestly ballsy thing to do because mm-hmm. if the people of Jericho found out that she had done this, she would have probably been put to death. Mm-hmm. Um, and the spies of Israel had really no reason to uphold their promises to her, especially with her being a prostitute, a social status and profession frowned upon in that society. The Israelites had no reason to keep their promise to her. Mm-hmm. And the people of Jericho, if they found out that she had basically sold them out to Israel, mm-hmm. she would have been put to death. So she mm-hmm. was really putting it all on the line. Wow. Very brave yeah and the spies of israel agreed to her plea and told her how to save her household when israel would come take over the city of jericho which i thought was really cool that they honored that because they didn't have to Mm -hmm. um so they found favor in rahab and they decided you know what like she's helping us and we're going to protect her at all Mm. costs and i thought that was really cool because that's not something that they were socially Mm -hmm. socially um constrained to do if Mm -hmm. you will Mm mm-hmm And another interesting fact is that Rahab married a man named Salmon, yes, like the fish, and (laughs) mothered Boaz. Hmm. I don't know if you guys know who Boaz is, but he's the man that will inevitably marry Ruth. And Ruth is the lady we're going to talk about next, so we'll hear more about that in a second. But it's pretty awesome to know that because even though Rahab was in the city of Jericho, Mm -hmm. she was still included in the lineage of Jesus because of her courage and what she decided to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so cool. I don't think she was necessarily an Israelite based on what I've read. I don't think she was an Israelite. I think she was an outsider Mm -hmm. of that, but God still allowed her into the lineage of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super cool. And I believe that the story of Rahab makes a similar point as Tamar's story in that God doesn't discriminate and he equally loves, cares, Mm. and will use people for amazing things if we choose to let him. Mm. And I really wanted to highlight Rahab's courage and her determination to go with her gut. And I think that it can be hard for women, especially in like the society that Rahab and even we live in today. Yeah. Um, But she's a great example of how women today can listen to their gut or the promptings of the Holy Spirit to be courageous even when our voice is shaking. Yes. Um, And I just, I love that example in the story of Rahab. Yeah, it can be especially hard um, to like speak up, Mm -hmm. um, especially when like people don't expect you to speak up or it's like not socially acceptable to or there's people that are like your boss that disagree or like you catch like i'm just thinking of an example like daily life like if your boss has a mistake and they like think that something is wrong but it's like is it my place to say that they're wrong Mm -hmm. um but i see that this is like a discrepancy or something um and so and just like daily life like keeping each other accountable um it can be hard for women and i'm sure even more so in this culture like in time um but even today it's still hard for women to speak up or feel like it's their right place to um but be courageous and god places that courage in rahab something i'm sure we all experience as women is like Mm -hmm. how do we know when to speak up and will we get push aside or turn down because i feel mm-hmm. like a lot of times when women speak up we're we're labeled certain negative things mm-hmm. but then like when a man speaks up like wow that's so courageous it's yeah like, what is this double <laughs> what a guy <laughs> yeah exactly right yeah. and so mm-hmm. i love that rahab was just like i don't care i'm doing it yeah um and it just encourages me or and i think yeah. a lot of women to yeah live like that and as moms because we both have daughters mm-hmm. um we, i have a one year old almost one year old now <laughs> and so i want to place that same bravery in her and help her find yeah. god giving her that um that she can speak up she can stand up straight like you know um be very and she is she's already like courageous she's like testing at wanting to walk um just helping her um, find her voice yeah. and um, give her that um, like even God wants us to God wants women to speak up and yeah. be equal and uh, be uh, examples and leaders so that's really awesome yeah. do you find that uh, since you've become a mom that uh, to a daughter <laughs> do you find any similarities there oh yeah like <laughs> 
I just even advocating for herself and like having to model that for her and or setting yeah. the boundary of like I, you know what I'm I'm just tired like mm-hmm. that's so hard to do right but at the same time like I'm modeling that for her mm-hmm. and I want her to see it's okay to say no if you're tired it's okay to say no if you don't feel good it's okay to speak up yeah. and say wait no like I need this or I need that and yeah it's okay to do that like you don't have to appease everyone because we're not going to appease everyone right you know and I'm such a people pleaser yeah so that's like something I'm still working on and like (laughs) understanding that um in life like I can I can be myself and also maybe not everything revolves around other people's happiness yeah um and you can't make everyone happy (laughs) that was like a realization I came to it was like I could do everything perfect Mm -hmm. and people can still choose to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so once I kind of like realized that and I realized like I'm just never going to please everyone. I'm never Mm going to be everyone's cup of tea. Like Mm -hmm. then I just decided, okay, well, what's important? And for me, it's like, all right, I'm going to speak up when I feel something is important. Yeah. And people can take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And they can choose to be upset or they can choose to receive it. It's okay. Yeah. Be your own person. Because I can't control their response anyway. I can still be respectful. I can still be kind and compassionate. I don't need to say it in a mean way. But but I think Mm -hmm. if we learn how to articulate our Mm -hmm. thoughts and opinions and feelings well, Mm -hmm. like however people respond, that's their choice. Yeah. So it took a lot of that pressure off. Yeah. And it's clear that Rahab articulated herself well yes and go rahab <laughs> <laughs> i love her i love her story it's beautiful so the third and final lady we're going to discuss today is ruth some of you may know a bit more about the story of ruth as there is a whole book of the bible dedicated to some of her story i recommend reading that as it is an incredible story um, but for today we're going to summarize and focus on a couple notable moments Um, So Ruth is all about a woman who did what she needed to do to protect the family bloodline that would inevitably produce Jesus the Messiah. That is super cool. Oh my (laughs) gosh. Oh my gosh. Wow. Um, She had an enormous amount of courage and walked in obedience as the Lord God guided her every step. Because of this, she was accounted as one of the maternal lineage accounts in the family bloodline of Jesus and was given Boaz, a kind and generous man, as a husband. Ruth was a Moabite Mm -hmm. woman who married into an Israeli family. Sadly, her husband, her brother-in-law, and her father-in-law all pass away, leaving her, Orpah, Mm -hmm her sister-in-law, and Naomi, her mother-in-law, as widows to decide to uproot from Moab to Judah. This would mean that Ruth would be leaving her hometown, her family, which would have been socially acceptable for her to return to as a widow to be cared for. However, Ruth knew if she moved back home, she would be leaving Naomi for dead, as should be an older, unmarried woman. Oh... Yeah, so basically, uh, Naomi, because she lost her husband and her two sons, like, would have no one to care for her. So she Mm. was basically going to be going back to Judah and Mm. living off the streets, basically. Mm. She would have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And Ruth didn't really feel right doing that. So Ruth could have easily gone back to her family, and that would have been socially acceptable because she was a widow, and her Mm -hmm. family would uh, resume taking care of her. Mm. But Ruth was like, no, I can't do that to Naomi. Like, I can't leave my mother-in-law out on the street, basically. So Mm -hmm. Ruth decided, I'm actually going to leave my hometown, my family, and I'm going to go live with my mother-in-law in in Judah, Mm. and I'm going to help care for her, and we're going to figure it out. Wow. But, like, as widows they had nothing Mm. they had nothing um orpa decided to go back to her family Mm -hmm. um so it was just ruth and naomi at this point wow talk about like stepping out of your comfort zone Mm -hmm. and after all those losses when you're dealing with mourning and heartbreak yep wow okay so ruth couldn't do that to her mother-in-law so she went to the land of judah with naomi and began to find a way to provide for them she picked grain from the field Ugh backbreaking yep yeah hard work um so she picked a grain from the field of a man named boaz and ultimately her and naomi 
um, concocted a plan to see if Boaz would take Ruth as his wife. Oh, I love this. They like played matchmaker. Like, <laughs> so let's see. <laughs> okay. And then also it is important to note here that Boaz was Naomi's relative through marriage to her husband. What Elimelech. Is this? Elimelech. Yes. A very interesting name. So yeah. Naomi had a husband who had passed away, like mm-hmm. we talked about, Elimelech. Mm-hmm. And Boaz is actually a relative of Elimelech. So I don't mm-hmm. know if it's a cousin or a brother-in-law or what, but somehow he knows Naomi. And I'm, I'm assuming this is probably why Naomi was like, oh, I'll go back to Judah because I have some distant relatives. Maybe they will help me out. Mm-hmm. And it would not be uncommon at that time for um, people that didn't have an, a lot, like maybe um, poor people or like mm-hmm. homeless people or something like that, it would mm-hmm. not be inappropriate at that time for them to go behind field workers and pick up pick up leftover grain mm. um, to try and make like wheat for bread and things like that. So he had heard of what Ruth had done because, mm-hmm. again, that's not something that would have happened in that time culturally. Mm-hmm. Like they would have just parted ways. Mm-hmm. And Boaz was like, oh, wow, like Ruth, that's incredible that you're caring for Naomi, who is oh. kind of his distant relative. Yeah. Um. So he actually like adding another piece of the story here he actually told his workers to drop extra grain on the floor for ruth Mm -hmm. too and to not like shoo her away or anything like that because he knew that she was taking care of naomi yeah that's so sweet yet again a woman's courage courageous and protective instincts were rewarded in a biblical story i love that Mm -hmm. ruth worked boaz's field was able to provide for her mother-in-law Naomi and eventually marries Boaz to redeem the family. Ruth's story is another testament to when God cares for people uh, and loves people that society would deem an outcast. He cares for the least of us, especially those that are brokenhearted, grieving, or cast aside. We see that throughout the canon of scripture. And I can't wait to continue to unpack more of these stories of incredible women that reveal the depths of God's love for each of us. I was doing some research on all this and I was like, man, the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is going to be so big Mm -hmm. and there's going to be so much to it. Like, I didn't feel right cramming Mm -hmm. that in. And, like, there's so many amazing women. So, at some yeah. point, this is probably going to end up being, like, four episodes on just the women of the Bible, which is awesome. Like, this is the the mm-hmm. end of episode two. And, like I said, mm-hmm. go back, watch episode one or listen to episode one if you want. But mm-hmm. I'm excited to take our time and really work through their stories because when yeah. you really get into the nitty-gritty of their stories, however mm-hmm. crazy or Netflix-worthy they may be, you see just how much God cares and how much he wants to redeem and reconcile with people and how he's willing to use the least of these or the people yeah. that are most unexpected yeah, um, or the outcasts of society, yeah. air quotes, you know? Mm-hmm. And I just love that. So I, I hope that you guys are enjoying this these episodes of Not Suited for Sunday School. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so glad Sandy got to be here with me again and we get yeah. to learn this together. And yeah, until mm-hmm. next time. Yeah. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you. And see you in the next one. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.